Uh, thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's a great sign of grace that you allow an Irishman to address you here in Sydney at the university, but it's always a thrill to be with a bunch of enthusiastic students, and I'm simply delighted to be here for this intensive week of debate and discussion. The topic before us today is a topic that I've been debating recently, last week with Christopher Hitchens, the author of God is Not Great, and a little while ago with Richard Dawkins, who's a colleague of mine at Oxford. Atheism has become militant, and it's become militant for a very obvious reason. Richard Dawkins says that 9-11 radicalized him, and the logic of the new atheism is very simple. That is religion. It is unacceptable. Therefore, we must eliminate it. How are we going to eliminate it? We use the cultural authority of science. And so one can understand these people, when they look around the world and they see what things are being done in the name of religion, they also observe that there's a great deal of blind faith going on. Indeed, Richard Dawkins thinks that all religious faith is blind and is therefore extremely dangerous. So we need to address this and ask ourselves the question, is there anything left for Christianity, in my case, to say into this situation. I want to admit straight away to you that there is an unacceptable face to religion. I come from Northern Ireland, and perhaps that's enough to indicate to you that I haven't a hope to start with, because I've experienced the unacceptable face of sectarianism. And of course, the new atheists remind us constantly of what happened during the Crusades when Muslims and Jews were slaughtered in the name of Christ. I'm ashamed of it. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ was ever associated with it for this reason, because Christ himself forbade the use of violence or force to promote either himself or his message. So my conclusion is this, that far from obeying Christ, people that took up arms to defend him and promote his message were disobeying him. And we need to distinguish between use and abuse. Saying with Christopher Hitchens that religion poisons everything is just about as useful as saying science poisons everything. It's given us napalm, it's given us poison gas, therefore let's abolish science to get rid of this abuse. That would be nonsensical. We need a much more nuanced debate. But I want to just point out here the reason why Jesus Christ forbade his followers to use violence. When he was accused in front of the Roman governor Pilate, of promoting the very thing that the new atheists fear, that is religious violence. Pilate exonerated him from the charge because he listened to Jesus quietly say to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would have been fighting. And Pilate was puzzled. He wanted to know what kind of a government Christ represented. And he said, to this end was I born, and to this end I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Upon which Pilate famously said, what is truth? But he knew, of course. He knew as well as all of us know that the one thing you cannot do is impose truth by power or violence. And it seems to me that the new atheists, instead of criticizing Jesus, ought to be applauding because of the fact that he was against pseudo-religion and bigotry, and that he insisted on the fact that we are open and free to consider the truth. This is one of the reasons that I am a Christian, because my Christianity, far from closing down the intellectual horizons, opens them. I'm allowed to think about truth, and I have come to believe that Jesus Christ is ultimately the truth. And in this whole debate, it's really a debate about two diametrically opposed worldviews. 
On the one hand, there is atheism that tells us that this universe is all that exists. There's nothing beyond. The universe can be self-explained ultimately in terms of fundamental particles of mass and energy. Or the universe isn't all that there is. There is transcendence. There is a God who created it and upholds it. That is the clash that we are witnessing in our society today. It's not a clash so much between science and religion. That ought to be obvious to you. Because just take, for, exa for example, the Human Genome Project. Its first head was Jim Watson, co-discoverer of the double helix structure of DNA, for which he won the Nobel Prize with Francis Crick. He's an outspoken atheist, and I've discussed with him his atheism, which motivated him. The current director of the Human Pre Genome Project is Francis Collins, an equally brilliant scientist, but this time a Christian. So it's not a question of science versus faith in God. It's a question of two worldviews that are clashing, and there are scientists on both sides. And what we've got to do is make up our minds as to which of these worldviews makes most sense and where Jesus fits in to that worldview. The new atheists tell us to imagine with John Lennon a world without religion, a world without the Taliban, a world without Northern Ireland, although how anyone on earth would want the world to be without Northern Ireland, I don't know, but we understand what he means. A world without that unacceptable face. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not John Lennon, I'm John Lennox. And there's just a little bit of difference. I want you to imagine a world without atheism, a world without Pol Pot, a world without Stalin, a world without Mao. The thing that concerns me about the new atheism is a very simple and obvious thing. It's that they try to heap all the blame for the ills of the world and religion while simultaneously attempting to distance atheism from all atrocity. And that is revisionist history. I expect them to be anti-theology by definition, but I do expect them to take history seriously because revisionism in history is the first mark of a descent that we know all too well, within my lifetime at least, descended into totalitarianism. Atheism, says Richard Dawkins, I cannot imagine, he writes, an atheist who would bulldoze Chartres or Notre Dame cathedrals. But I've spent a lot of time in Russia, many, many times. I've been there to see what atheism has done. Has Dawkins never heard what Stalin did in raising cathedral after cathedral and church after church into the ground? But it's worse than that. I have sat with a girl aged 13 in the German Democratic Republic on the day she came weeping home from school. No more education, the brightest girl in the class. Why? Because she would not publicly swear allegiance to the atheistic state. And that kind of intellectual murder was committed many times. I'm accepting that religion has an unacceptable face. But to pretend that atheism is the solution, to my mind, is a historical absurdity, in fact. And the tragedy is, and that's what concerns me, is the new atheism heading in the same way as its previous incarnation, which we've come to know as communism. And I find myself as a scientist rather amused at the attempts of the new atheist to enlist science to destroy religion when it was Christianity, actually, the Judeo-Christian heritage that gave them their science in the first place. Joseph Needham was a Marxist and a brilliant chemist and also a sinologist, uh, an expert on China, and he tried to work out why it was that science as such as distinct from technology did not develop in China as it had developed in the West. And he came to the conclusion as a Marxist that it was the fact that they didn't have the concept of a rational creator so that science could be done because people believed not simply that nature was ordered, but that there was a rational creator who'd created human minds and that they therefore might be capable of understanding what the creator had done. 
Now that's fascinating, but it means that I'm not ashamed a little bit of my Christianity and my science because that was the cradle out of which science grew. And of course, the new atheists want to argue that the cradle is no longer necessary. But they make a profound mistake when they call all religious faith blind. Indeed, they say all faith is blind because they don't believe that faith's involved in science. That's nonsense also. Every scientist believes that the universe, as I've just said, is rationally intelligible. Now, how do you ground that belief? Atheism of the Dawkins variety tells me that in the end the human mind is a very unreliable object because it's been cobbled together by a mindless, unguided process. How could it reveal anything like truth? So I want to argue that atheism does a very good job in undermining the rationality that underlines science. Whereas Christian theism tells me that the reason that I can in part understand the universe out there is because it and the human mind are ultimately go back to a creator God. So I'm concerned about the new atheism from the perspective of rationality. I'm concerned about its imbalance in its understanding of history. But the situation actually gets worse still. When it comes to ethics and morality, ladies and gentlemen, one of the crises in global society is the question of where we find a base for ethics. We all sense that we're moral beings, but where do we get a base for ethics? If you read the New Atheists, you find they're full of moral outrage. They're constantly ranting about the evils of religion. But I want to know where they get this confidence about what is good and what is evil from. Because Richard Dawkins admits it is almost impossible to found ethics and certainly to have a concept of absolute values on anything other than a religious basis. I think he's making an understatement. Because when we follow the logic of, the, of his argument, we discover he tells us this. The universe is precisely what you would expect if at bottom there is no good, there is no evil, there is no justice. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. He's never retracted those words. Just think of what they mean. The people that flew the planes into the Twin Towers in New York, just dancing to the music of their DNA, Pol Pot eliminating a million intellectuals, was dancing to the music of his DNA. Well, if that is true, of course, we can't blame any of them, can we? In other words, the new atheists, on the one hand, are full of moral outrage, but when we investigate the basis for their morality, we find it dissolves like acid. There's nothing there. Nor, indeed, is there any justice. That's where I get morally outraged. According to atheism, ladies and gentlemen, no terrorist victim will ever see justice. A Hitler can gas six million Jews and then just blow his brains out with a single pistol shot. He dies a little bit earlier than he expected, but he gets away with it if there's no ultimate justice. If morality, as E.O. Wilson and Michael Ruth say, is simply an illusion fobbed off on us by our selfish genes to get us to cooperate, then your moral sense is an illusion. Your notion that there is justice somewhere in the universe is a delusion. Is that really the way the world is? Of course it might be. We've got to decide on the basis of evidence. What I want to say into that vacuum is this that whatever else Christianity teaches, it teaches that your moral sense is no illusion, that there is to be a final accounting after death, there is to be a judgment. And that is not something to represent God as some awful tyrant, it is a magnificent thing. 
that there is ultimately to be a fair assessment. And the New Testament declares that the judge has already been appointed. His name is Jesus Christ. And Paul, speaking to the philosophers of the ancient world in Athens long ago, said that God has determined a day in which he will judge the world by the man he has appointed. And he's given assurance to all people, not just to Christian believers, but to all people, in that he has raised him from the dead. You say, do you believe that as a scientist? Surely, come on. This is the 21st century, and you're at Oxford. Do you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes, I do. But didn't David Hume teach us that miracles violate the laws of nature? Yes, he did it. He was wrong, wasn't he? David Hume is an interesting man to suggest that miracles violate the laws of nature when he didn't really believe in causality, so he had no basis on which to set up laws. But I think it's very important for us to realize that miracles of the type in the New Testament, like the resurrection of Jesus, don't violate the laws of nature. If you put $20 plus $20 in your drawer at your bed tonight in your student accommodation, and you find $5 there tomorrow morning, you don't say that the laws of arithmetic have been broken, do you? You might say the laws of Australia have been broken. <laughs> it's the fact that you know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 that tells you that somebody has put their hand into the system. And you see, the New Testament people were not primitive, pre-scientific people that thought that people popped up from the dead every day of the week, or folks were born of a virgin. That's nonsense. They knew as well as we do that people born blind never get seeing, so that when Jesus rose from the dead, because they knew the regularity, they recognized that this was something special. God who is the creator and ultimately responsible for the laws, which are our descriptions of the regularities on which nature runs, isn't a prisoner of his own laws. That would be absurd. They're not like the laws of Australia. They're descriptions of what normally happens. God, if he chooses, can feed something special into the system. And that's exactly what happened when he coded himself into humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. And as we read in the New Testament, the Word became flesh. So then, I want to argue a number of things here in connection with morality. I think the moral thing is by far the most important one, because you and I are moral beings. We have that sense of justice. We do have massive questions with it. I do, as a Christian. The hardest question that I face, and one of you will ask it, so I might as well ask myself it. The hardest question I face is, how does all this subsist with the suffering that's in the world? Because many of the new atheists, their reason, and many of my colleagues at Oxford, their reason for not believing in God is the mess this world's in. Well, they may be right. Take God out of it, and you've solved the problem. You've got an intellectual solution. This is just the way the world is. It's hard luck for most people. Some of us are fortunate enough to come to a university like this and get a good education, get good jobs. We're in the minority in the world. But that's just how it is. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Is that really how it is? Let's just notice, ladies and gentlemen, that if you remove God, you can solve an intellectual problem at one level, but you create another one. You haven't got rid of the suffering, have you? But what you have got rid of is hope. Atheism is a hopeless philosophy. The millions of people who were gassed by Hitler, the multi-millions that perished under Stalin. No hope. No hope. And this is where Christianity doesn't compete with any other religion, because it offers me something that no other offers me. 
at the heart of the Christian faith is a cross. It's a puzzle to many people. How could a person dying 20 centuries ago have any relevance to me in a high-powered university like the University of Sydney in the 21st century? I've stood many times in Auschwitz. I spent a lot of my life in atheist countries studying the systematic exposure to atheism in various education systems in the former Soviet Union. And I've wept every time I've been in Auschwitz. I'm not ashamed to say that. When you see the hideous nature of what some people did to others. I still believe in God. Now, why is that? It's not that I've got a simplistic answer to all the questions, but it's this. If, follow me, if you will, if Jesus Christ is really who he claimed to be, that is God incarnate, God encoded, if you like, in human DNA, then what is God doing on a cross? It tells me at least this, doesn't it? That God does not remain distant from our human suffering, but has become part of it. And it is that that gives me a window of hope and understanding of the possibility that one day, not necessarily yet, there will be a fuller understanding. The big question for me is this. Is there enough evidence to pin your life on a commitment to this person? Does he make sense of the universe? I mean, after all, this is a person in human terms around 30 years old, just a bit older than some of you and half my age, who stands on our planet and quietly says to his contemporaries, I am the truth. Not, I say true things, although that was truth. That was true. But I am the truth. What is the truth behind this universe? What is the truth behind you as a human being? And of course, you can unravel that and go back and back and back. Does the regress go on infinitely? I don't think it does. I think at the end of those chains of questioning, you'll find there's a person standing who says, I am the truth. The claim is so spectacularly large that it's either absurd or it's true. There's no halfway. C.S. Lewis, who was an atheist when he first came to consider this, could see that here are claims of such an order that the person making them must be an utterly deranged megalomaniac or there must be something in it. Which, of course, brings me back to the question of evidence where I started. You see, ladies and gentlemen, faith is not as Richard Dawkins defines it. He defines faith of all kinds to be belief where not only is there no evidence, but you jolly well know there's no evidence. Well, I don't know where he got the definition from. He certainly didn't get it from any serious Christian, nor did he get it from the New Testament. Because the New Testament is very clear in telling us that faith is a commitment based on evidence. The fourth biographer of Jesus, the man we call the Apostle John, says at the end of his biography, he says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, here's the evidence. Consider it. Of course, let me point out, it is not simply evidence that a certain proposition is true. It is evidence that a certain person is true. Let me perhaps give you an illustration of it. When I arrived at university, like you have done, in my first week I saw a very, very beautiful girl. So the first evidence I took in about her was visual. Yes? Then I talked to her, and I had evidence through my ears. And then we got to know one another and discovered we common interests. So it built up a whole cumulative picture until I came to the point where 
was I going to commit myself to her? I didn't know everything about her, but that commitment was based on what I already knew. There was real evidence there. It's exactly the same at a higher level with a commitment in faith to Jesus Christ. I'd be a fool to believe in him if there was no evidence. So then, the new atheists, it seemed to me, do point out, and I sympathize with them, and I've told them so, their analysis of what's wrong with this world is partly right. There is an unacceptable face to religion, and we need to face it. But you know, as I said to Richard Dawkins in my debate, and you can see it online, he's an atheist, so is Stalin. I wouldn't dream of accusing Richard Dawkins of the atrocities that Stalin has, com has committed. In fact, I would defend him against that accusation. In other words, I would discriminate between atheists. He expects me to do that, quite rightly. What I would like to ask the new atheists is they do the same. Because by lumping together all religion in the following argument, 9-11 is religion. Yes, it's fanatical religion. But fanatical religion thrives at the edge of moderate religion, so all religion must go. Well, if you take that view, you're ending dialogue and rationality. To lump the Taliban together with a peace-loving Amish is to say you're not interested in discourse. And what I would like to see is a public square, where each of us can bring our worldview without fear to the table and openly discuss it. What intensely bothers me about the new atheism is its incipient totalitarianism. Sam Harris is saying some people's ideas are so poisonous that they probably ought to be eliminated. Where have we heard that kind of thing before? Richard Dawkins and others use words like child abuse in connection with teaching one's faith to one's children. I notice they don't say the same about atheism, although in the world in which I moved for many years, in Russia and in the Iron Curtain countries, you don't teach Christianity to your children, but you could stuff them full of atheism for all you wanted. Is that the world they want to bring us to? And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like an assurance from these new atheists that they're not going to land us down with Peter Singer. Because it's like this. The new atheists are soft atheists. Hard atheists like Nietzsche and Camus and Sartre look at the new atheists and they'd say, look what you're trying to do. You're trying to keep liberal, enlightenment so-called, but actually Christian values, and at the same time have atheism. You can't do it ultimately. Because if you really take atheism seriously, you will end up destroying the entire value system that we've had for centuries. And you'll end up believing with John Gray that human life is of no more significance than slime mold, or with Peter Singer, quite logically and consistently with his atheism, saying that a newborn baby, particularly a damaged one, is of no, value, no more value than a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Ladies and gentlemen, these are serious issues, and we need to think about them. The one worldview teaches me that you are a creature ultimately made in the image of God, whatever other biological mechanisms have been involved. You are made in the image of God, and therefore you have infinite value. And diametrically opposed to it is the view that you have no more significance than a humble form of bacteria called slime mold. A great deal at stake, isn't there? Thank you very much.